Chapter Nine of Son of Tarzan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Son of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Nine. It was an unhappy Korak who wandered aimlessly through the jungle the day following his inhospitable reception by the great apes. His heart was heavy from disappointment. Unsatisfied vengeance smoldered in his breast. He looked with hatred upon the denizens of his jungle world, bearing his fighting fangs and growling at those that came within radius of his senses. The mark of his father's early life was strong upon him, and enhanced by months of association with beasts, from whom the imitative faculty of youth had absorbed a countless number of little mannerisms of the predatory creatures of the wild. He bared his fangs now as naturally and upon as slight provocation as Sheeta the panther bared his. He growled as ferociously as Akut himself. When he came suddenly upon another beast his quick crouch bore a strange resemblance to the arching of a cat's back. Korak, the killer, was looking for trouble. In his heart of hearts he hoped to meet the king ape who had driven him from the amphitheater. To this end he insisted upon remaining in the vicinity but the exigencies of the perpetual search for food led them several miles further away during day. They were moving slowly downwind, and warily, because the advantage was with whatever beast might chance to be hunting ahead of them, where their scent spore was being borne by the light breeze. Suddenly the two halted simultaneously. Two heads were cocked upon one side. Like creatures hewn from solid rock, they stood immovable, listening. Not a muscle quivered. For several seconds they remained thus. Then Korak advanced cautiously a few yards and leaped nimbly into a tree. Akut followed close upon his heels. Neither had made a noise that would have been appreciable to human ears at a dozen paces. Stopping often to listen, they crept forward through the trees. That both were greatly puzzled was apparent from the questioning looks they cast at one another from time to time. Finally the lad caught a glimpse of a palisade a hundred yards ahead, and beyond it the tops of some goatskin tents and a number of thatched huts. His lip upcurled in a savage snarl. Blacks! How he hated them! He signed to Akut to remain where he was while he advanced to reconnoiter. Woe betide the unfortunate villager whom the killer came upon now! Slinking through the lower branches of the trees, leaping lightly from one jungle giant to its neighbor, where the distance was not too great, or swinging from one hand hold to another, Korak came silently toward the village. He heard a voice beyond the palisade, and toward that he made his way. A great tree overhung the enclosure at the very point from which the voice came. Into this Korak crept. His spear was ready in his hand. His ears told him of the proximity of a human being. All that his eyes required was a single glance to show him his target. Then, lightning-like, the missile would fly to its goal. With raised spear he crept among the branches of the tree, glaring narrowly downward in search of the owner of the voice which rose to him from below. At last he saw a human back. The spear-hand flew to the limit of the throwing position to gather the force that would send the iron-shod missile completely through the body of the unconscious victim. And then the killer paused. He leaned forward a little to get a better view of the target. Was it to ensure more perfect aim, or had there been that in the graceful lines and the childish curves of the little body below him that had held in check the spirit of murder running riot in his veins? He lowered his spear cautiously that it might make no noise by scraping against foliage or branches. Quietly he crouched in a comfortable position along a great limb, and there he lay with wide eyes looking down in wonder upon the creature he had crept upon to kill, looking down upon a little girl, a little nut-brown maiden. The snarl had gone from his lip. His only expression was one of interested attention. He was trying to discover what the girl was doing. Suddenly a broad grin overspread his face, for a turn of the girl's body had revealed Geeka of the ivory head and the rat-skin torso, Geeka of the splinter limbs and the disreputable appearance. The little girl raised the marred face to hers, and rocking herself backward and forward crooned a plaintive Arab lullaby to the doll. 
a softer light entered the eyes of the killer. For a long hour that passed very quickly to him, Korak lay with gaze riveted upon the playing child. Not once had he had a view of the girl's full face. For the most part he saw only a mass of wavy black hair, one brown little shoulder exposed upon the side from where her single robe was caught beneath her arm, and a shapely knee protruding from beneath her garment as she sat cross-legged upon the ground. A tilt of the head as she emphasized some maternal admonition to the passive Geeka revealed occasionally a rounded cheek or a piquant little chin. Now she was shaking a slim finger at Geeka, reprovingly, and again she crushed to her heart this only object upon which she might lavish the untold wealth of her childish affections. Korak, momentarily forgetful of his bloody mission, permitted the fingers of his spear-hand to relax a little their grasp upon the shaft of his formidable weapon. It slipped, almost falling, but the occurrence recalled the killer to himself. It reminded him of his purpose in slinking stealthily upon the owner of the voice that had attracted his vengeful attention. He glanced at the spear, with its well-worn grip and cruel barbed head. Then he let his eyes wander again to the dainty form below him. In imagination he saw the heavy weapon shooting downward. He saw it pierce the tender flesh, driving its way deep into the yielding body. He saw the ridiculous doll drop from its owner's arms to lie sprawled and pathetic beside the quivering body of the little girl. The killer shuddered, scowling at the inanimate iron and wood of the spear, as though they constituted a sentient being endowed with a malignant mind. Korak wondered what the girl would do were he to drop suddenly from the tree to her side. Most likely she would scream and run away. Then would come the men of the village with spears and guns and set upon him. They would either kill him or drive him away. A lump rose in the boy's throat. He craved the companionship of his own kind, though he scarce realized how greatly. He would have liked to slip down beside the little girl and talk with her, though he knew from the words he had overheard that she spoke a language with which he was unfamiliar. They could have talked by signs a little. That would have been better than nothing. Too, he would have been glad to see her face. What he had glimpsed assured him that she was pretty, but her strongest appeal to him lay in the affectionate nature revealed by her gentle mothering of the grotesque doll. At last he hit upon a plan. He would attract her attention and reassure her by a smiling greeting from a greater distance. Silently he wormed his way back into the tree. It was his intention to hail her from beyond the palisade, giving her the feeling of security which he imagined the stout barricade would afford. He had scarcely left his position in the tree when his attention was attracted by a considerable noise upon the opposite side of the village. By moving a little he could see the gate at the far end of the main street. A number of men, women, and children were running toward it. It swung open, revealing the head of a caravan upon the opposite side. In trooped the motley organization, black slaves and dark-hued Arabs of the northern deserts, cursing camel-drivers urging on their vicious charges, overburdened donkeys waving sadly pendulous ears while they endured with stoic patience the brutalities of their masters, goats, sheep, and horses. Into the village they all trooped behind a tall, sour old man, who rode without greetings to those who shrunk from his path directly to a large goatskin tent in the center of the village. Here he spoke to a wrinkled hag. Korak, from his vantage spot, could see it all. He saw the old man asking questions of the black woman, and then he saw the latter point toward a secluded corner of the village, which was hidden from the main street by the tents of the Arabs and the huts of the natives in the direction of the tree beneath which the little girl played. This was doubtless her father, thought Korak, he had been away, and his first thought upon returning was of his little daughter. How glad she would be to see him! How she would run and throw herself into his arms, to be crushed to his breast and covered with his kisses! Korak sighed. He thought of his own father and mother far away in London. He returned to his place in the tree above the girl. If he couldn't have happiness of this sort himself, he wanted to enjoy the happiness of others. 
Possibly, if he had made himself known to the old man, he might be permitted to come to the village occasionally as a friend. It would be worth trying. He would wait until the old Arab had greeted his daughter. Then he would make his presence known with signs of peace. The Arab was striding softly toward the girl. In a moment he would be beside her, and then how surprised and delighted she would be. Korak's eyes sparkled in anticipation. And now the old man stood behind the little girl. His stern old face was still unrelaxed. The child was yet unconscious of his presence. She prattled on to the unresponsive Geeka. Then the old man coughed. With a start the child glanced quickly up over her shoulder. Korak could see her full face now. It was very beautiful in its sweet and innocent childishness, all soft and lovely curves. He could see her great dark eyes. He looked for the happy love-light that would follow recognition. But it did not come. Instead, terror, stark, paralyzing terror was mirrored in her eyes, in the expression of her mouth, in the tense, cowering attitude of her body. A grim smile curved the thin, cruel lip of the Arab. The child essayed to crawl away, but before she could get out of his reach the old man kicked her brutally, sending her sprawling upon the grass. Then he followed her up to seize and strike her as was his custom. Above them, in the tree, a beast crouched where a moment before had been a boy, a beast with dilating nostrils and bared fangs, a beast that trembled with rage. The sheik was stooping to reach for the girl when the killer dropped to the ground at his side. His spear was still in his left hand, but he had forgotten it. Instead, his right fist was clenched, and as the sheik took a backward step, astonished by the sudden materialization of this strange apparition, apparently out of clear air, the heavy fist landed full upon his mouth, backed by the weight of the young giant and the terrific power of his more than human muscles. Bleeding and senseless, the sheik sank to earth. Korak turned toward the child. She had regained her feet and stood wide-eyed and frightened, looking first into his face and then, horror-struck, at the recumbent figure of the sheik. In an involuntary gesture of protection, the killer threw an arm about the girl's shoulders and stood waiting for the Arab to regain consciousness. For a moment they remained thus, when the girl spoke. "'When he regains his senses, he will kill me,' she said in Arabic. Korak could not understand her. He shook his head, speaking to her first in English, and then in the language of the great apes, but neither of these was intelligible to her. She leaned forward and touched the hilt of the long knife that the Arab wore. Then she raised her clasped hand above her head and drove an imaginary blade into her breast above her heart. Korak understood. The old man would kill her. The girl came to his side again and stood there trembling. She did not fear him. Why should she? He had saved her from a terrible beating at the hands of the sheik. Never in her memory had another so befriended her. She looked up into his face. It was a boyish, handsome face, nut-brown like her own. She admired the spotted leopard skin that circled his lithe body from one shoulder to his knees. The metal anklets and armlets adorning him aroused her envy. Always had she coveted something of the kind, but never had the sheik permitted her more than the single cotton garment that barely sufficed to cover her nakedness. No furs or silks or jewelry had there ever been for little Miriam. And Korak looked at the girl. He had always held girls in a species of contempt. Boys who associated with them were, in his estimation, mollycoddles. He wondered what he should do. Could he leave her here to be abused, possibly murdered, by the villainous old Arab? No. But on the other hand, could he take her into the jungle with him? What could he accomplish burdened by a weak and frightened girl? She would scream at her own shadow when the moon came out upon the jungle night, and the great beast roamed, moaning and roaring through the darkness. He stood for several minutes buried in thought. The girl watched his face, wondering what was passing in his mind. She too was thinking of the future. She feared to remain and suffer the vengeance of the sheik. There was no one in all the world to whom she might turn other than this half-naked stranger who had dropped miraculously from the clouds to save her from one of the sheik's accustomed beatings. Would her new friend leave her now? 
Wistfully she gazed at his intent face. She moved a little closer to him, laying a slim brown hand upon his arm. The contact awakened the lad from his absorption. He looked down at her, and then his arm went about her shoulder once more, for he saw tears upon her lashes. Come, he said, the jungle is kinder than man. You shall live in the jungle, and Korak and Akut will protect you. She did not understand his words, but the pressure of his arm drawing her away from the prostrate Arab and the tents was quite intelligible. One little arm crept about his waist, and together they walked toward the palisade. Beneath the great tree that had harbored Korak while he watched the girl at play, he lifted her in his arms, and, throwing her lightly across his shoulder, leaped nimbly into the lower branches. Her arms were about his neck, and from one little hand Geeka dangled down his straight young back. And so Miriam entered the jungle with Korak, trusting in her childish innocence the stranger who had befriended her, and perhaps influenced in her belief in him by that strange intuitive power possessed by woman. She had no conception of what the future might hold. She did not know, nor could she have guessed the manner of life led by her protector. Possibly she pictured a distant village similar to that of the Sheik, in which lived other white men like the stranger. That she was to be taken into the savage primeval life of a jungle beast could not have occurred to her. Had it, her little heart would have palpitated with fear. Often had she wished to run away from the cruelties of the Sheik and Mabunu, but the dangers of the jungle always had deterred her. The two had gone but a short distance from the village when the girl spied the huge proportions of the great Akut. With a half-stifled scream she clung more closely to Korak and pointed fearfully toward the ape. Akut, thinking that the killer was returning with a prisoner, came growling toward them. A little girl aroused no more sympathy in the beast's heart than would a full-grown bull-ape. She was a stranger, and therefore to be killed. He bared his yellow fangs as he approached, and to his surprise the killer bared his likewise, but he bared them at Akut and snarled menacingly. Ah, oh, thought Akut, the killer has taken a mate. And so, obedient to the tribal laws of his kind, he left them alone, becoming suddenly absorbed in a fuzzy caterpillar of peculiarly succulent appearance. The larva disposed of, he glanced from the corner of an eye at Korak. The youth had deposited his burden upon a large limb, where she clung desperately to keep from falling. "'She will accompany us,' said Korak to Akut, jerking a thumb in the direction of the girl. "'Do not harm her. We will protect her.' Akut shrugged. To be burdened by the young of man was in no way to his liking. He could see from her evident fright at her position on the branch, and from the terrified glances she cast in his direction, that she was hopelessly unfit. By all the ethics of Akut's training and inheritance, the unfit should be eliminated. But if the killer wished this, there was nothing to be done about it but to tolerate her. Akut certainly didn't want her. Of that he was quite positive. Her skin was too smooth and hairless, quite snake-like, in fact, and her face was most unattractive, not at all like that of a certain lovely he had particularly noticed among the apes in the amphitheatre the previous night. Ah, there was true feminine beauty for one, a great generous mouth, lovely yellow fangs, and the cutest, softest side-whiskers. Akut sighed. Then he rose, expanded his great chest, and strutted back and forth along a substantial branch, for even a puny thing like this she of Korax might admire his fine coat and his graceful carriage. But poor little Miriam only shrank closer to Korak, and almost wished that she were back in the village of the Sheik, where the terrors of existence were of human origin, and so more or less familiar. The hideous ape frightened her. He was so large and so ferocious in appearance. His actions she could only interpret as a menace, for how could she guess that he was parading to excite admiration? Nor could she know of the bond of fellowship which existed between this great brute and the godlike youth who had rescued her from the sheik. Miriam spent an evening and a night of unmitigated terror. Korak and Akut led her along dizzy ways as they searched for food. Once they hid her in the branches of a tree while they stalked a nearby buck. 
even her natural terror of being left alone in the awful jungle was submerged in a greater horror as she saw the man and the beast spring simultaneously upon their prey and drag it down as she saw the handsome face of her preserver contorted in a bestial snarl as she saw his strong white teeth buried in the soft flesh of the kill when he came back to her blood smeared his face and hands and breast and she shrank from him as he offered her a huge hunk of hot raw meat he was evidently much disturbed by her refusal to eat and when a moment later he scampered away into the forest to return with fruit for her she was once more forced to alter her estimation of him this time she did not shrink but acknowledged his gift with a smile that had she known it was more than ample payment to the affection-starved boy the sleeping problem vexed korak he knew that the girl could not balance herself in safety in a tree crotch while she slept nor would it be safe to permit her to sleep upon the ground open to the attacks of prowling beasts of prey there was but a single solution that presented itself he must hold her in his arms all night and that he did with akut braced upon one side of her and he upon the other so that she was warmed by the bodies of them both she did not sleep much until the night was half spent but at last nature overcame her terrors of the black abyss beneath and the hairy body of the wild beast at her side and she fell into a deep slumber which outlasted the darkness when she opened her eyes the sun was well up at first she could not believe in the reality of her position her head had rolled from Korak's shoulder so that her eyes were directed upon the hairy back of the ape. At sight of it she shrank away. Then she realized that someone was holding her, and turning her head she saw the smiling eyes of the youth regarding her. When he smiled she could not fear him, and now she shrank closer against him in natural revulsion toward the rough coat of the brute upon her other side. Korak spoke to her in the language of the apes but she shook her head and spoke to him in the language of the arab which was as unintelligible to him as was ape speech to her akut sat up and looked at them he could understand what korak said but the girl made only foolish noises that were entirely unintelligible and ridiculous akut could not understand what korak saw in her to attract him he looked at her long and steadily appraising her carefully then he scratched his head rose and shook himself his movement gave the girl a little start she had forgotten akut for the moment again she shrank from him the beast saw that she feared him and being a brute enjoyed the evidence of the terror his brutishness inspired crouching he extended his huge hand stealthily toward her as though to seize her she shrank still further away akut's eyes were busy drinking in the humor of the situation he did not see the narrowing eyes of the boy upon him, nor the shortening neck as the broad shoulders rose in a characteristic attitude of preparation for attack. As the ape's fingers were about to close upon the girl's arm, the youth rose suddenly with a short, vicious growl. A clenched fist flew before Miriam's eyes to land full upon the snout of the astonished Akut. With an explosive bellow the anthropoid reeled backward and tumbled from the tree. Korak stood glaring down upon him when a sudden swish in the bushes close by attracted his attention. The girl, too, was looking down, but she saw nothing but the angry ape scrambling to his feet. Then, like a bolt from a crossbow, a mass of spotted yellow fur shot into view straight for Akut's back. It was Sheeta the leopard. End of chapter 9